Next up, we have Pierce McDonald. He and Licensed Hawk are IBM licensing experts. I thought Pierce might enjoy this. T-shirt, software license management, maximizing overconsumption. And many organizations really struggle with that in the IBM licensing world. Please give it up to Pierce. Let him know your feedback and appreciation. And I thank him and the others for sharing their knowledge with us as they are experts in the field. Thank you for joining us. Pierce McDonald is going to share his IBM licensing expertise with us. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and um, been looking forward to this uh, presentation at ITAM Summit. Uh, today's topic, topic is going to be around a framework responding to an IBM license audit. And I guess the first thing is, uh, where did this framework come from? Well, this is a framework that we have developed within License Hulk. And uh, over, I guess, many, many lists, having helped clients over the years uh, defend audits, we've put up with a framework. Now, this won't be overly detailed, but we'll, we'll give you a structure as to how you might think about typically responding to an audit and the high level tasks that uh, are involved. Um, so the, uh, Sorry. Um, so the agenda is quite a simple one. Um, we'll first of all have a look and see what is an IBM license audit, why you're getting it. And uh, then we're also then going to have a look at what you can expect from IBM's perspective. And then we're going to actually get into the nitty gritties really of how you should be thinking about responding it uh, from a client perspective. So what is an IBM license audit? Well, uh, IBM would define this as IBM verifies that the following license terms, uh, that you are following the license terms and conditions. Um, you may, and a license audit typically involves IBM assigning a third party, um, an auditor. Um, they call it a software license review, but the rest of us know it as an audit. Um, the auditor then will proceed to collect the data. Um, they will calculate and verify, and ultimately they will provide a compliance report. Now, this is just a, I suppose, a fact-based position that the audit presents. This thing gets handed over to IBM where a commercial settlement isn't reached um, for any shortfalls. So uh, your organization, believe it or not, agreed to audits when they first uh, signed up to a license agreement as part of their um, um, main agreement. But also every time that you sign uh, for your SNS or any kind of an, uh, of an agreement, and that does not have to be a an actual signature, you're accepting any changes. So um, recently there was an update to the IPLA and just by virtue of renewing your support, you essentially clicked uh, the acceptance of the audit terms there. So you do get caught no matter how you work it. Um, why is it so significant? Well, it's significant first of all, in terms of when, when, you, when an audit comes in, there's a lot of time and effort required to actually prepare for these things. You're going to have to collect the data, validate, verify. This is a significant disruption to your business. Um, but if that wasn't bad, the problem is very often the compliance gaps found, they're not small. They are can be hundreds of thousands, in some cases, many millions. And the last bit, of course, here is this one thing, having to go to all that effort, receiving the bill. This bill is very often unbudgeted expense. Your CFO will not be happy. And within the organization, it gets a very high profile and uh, and it ultimately is not a nice experience to be going through. So it's a significant impact to your business, so it should be taken very seriously. So when it comes to what you can expect, it's kind of two different perspectives, really. There is the one that IBM would share with you, and it would seem like a very simple process. And then there's the reality. Um, their official process really goes along. Um, you have a notification or the notification letter. Um, there is a kickoff and scoping call or series of calls, and then they will present you with a nice PowerPoint and a plan. And then the expectation is that you collect the data, send it back to them. They will collect it up, produce a report, and the project closes out. And if, again, if you were to take the uh, IBM's, uh, I guess, presentation out, this would take two to three months. The reality is very, very different. Um, I have never experienced uh, a license audit that 
got two or three months. In fact, they're very often err on the minimum of six months. And I've actually seen them going to 12 and 18 months, depending on how contentious the results were. Um, also, the steps that are described here really do simplify the process tremendously. There's a lot of details missing here. And that kind of leads us on really to the framework that we've developed to help. So when we respond to audits, we have a different approach. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you here. So we've got eight stages and uh, I'm going to do excuse me if I'm listing them off. And what you're going to find over the structure of this is we give one slide for each of the stages. And think of this as a framework. It's not meant to be exhaustive and there's a lot of detail under it, but it's a quite a good guideline. And if nothing else, it's a good checklist to see how well you've covered things off if you're preparing for an audit. So there's the initial uh, license audit response. And this is literally, what do you do when that letter arrives and the tasks that occur from there? There's an initial risk assessment, which is ultimately going to quickly identify how big is the problem and try and put some sort of a dollar value on the risk. In parallel, then you have the IBM license audit scope. And this very much emphasizes that uh, you can negotiate what's covered. And it's the first place where you really get to uh, push back on uh, the requests coming from IBM. You have an internal license audit. An internal license audit is really where you prepare all the information and try and get the best view before you send information over to the auditors. The next stage, then we look at optimization, remediation, and defense strategy. And this is really figuring out, you know what your problems are, what can you do to manage them, and what are your strategies going to be about defending it? The external audits where things get interesting. That's where You've declared the information, uh, you've shared it with the auditor, there will be a back and a forth over, well, if IBM were quoting it, they'd say probably over a month or two, can be much longer. And then once you've come to the end of that stage, the auditor will have done their job, there's a commercial settlement with IBM. That is really where you have to do the deal to pay for any shortfall in licensing. And finally, there's the actual audit close project, the close of the project. So let's get into the details, shall we? The initial audit response, the letter arrives. Once the initial, oh my God, fades away and you take a deep breath, what happens next? Well, we would say, if you have an audit, a uh, vendor audit protocol, initiate it. What is this, you might ask? Very, large, very often organizations are well used to getting audits from vendors. So they've established over time, maybe it's a checklist, maybe it's a very detailed process of how they handle audits. Find this out. This is the lessons learned from previous projects and can be invaluable in getting things moving. Verify the audit request. What exactly is, where does it come from? Uh, what is the detail of it? Have they identified, have they given you any clues as to the scope? Maybe it's the geographic, maybe it's the products covered and so forth. Next step then is going to be informing the stakeholders. Um, this is going to be a wide audience of people within your organization. They will be potentially legal, procurement, SAM managers, uh, the technical teams, there'll be a variety of people that you will need to contact to let them know that an IBM audit is in process, to be ready for it, but also to manage their communication themselves. Next one is going to be around a single point of contact. This will be both within the organization and indeed in the communication with the auditor. This ensures that and all the information is managed, the requests are managed properly, but also that information is reviewed and checked, and that it's no accidents occur, information is released that should not be. Then there's the simple process of initiating a project. As I mentioned, this is quite a significant impact on a business. Therefore, you need to put in place the formal structures of a project. There'll be a budget, there'll be a project manager, a full team. You may have to actually resource for third party support as well. So treat it as a project. You may need to engage some uh, consultants. When it comes to a license audit, I strongly advise you do because your in-house team will not have the experience that a third party team will. But this might be a once in a three year event for you. A license audit team, uh, the third party consultants will probably have done five this month already. And the last piece of this stage is con confirm receipt and the conditional support of the auditor. Let them know you got the message and that you're working on it. Then we enter the next stage. Initial risk assessment. The goal really here is to try and quickly identify how bad is the situation. The main question that senior managers are going to be posing to you is, once they hear there's an audit, they go, how bad is it? Do we have any idea how much this is going to cost us? 
And this particular piece in the project is what this is trying to achieve. It is not trying to get a perfect answer. It's trying to get a sense of the order of magnitude, how, how much information is available, how big this project is going to be, how bad might the number be right now? So steps involved here will be collecting the available entitlement information, what's available from a deployment perspective. The focus is very much on big fix and ILMT because this information is readily available it is also what should be being recorded as part of your subcapacity licensing. And you'll prepare this initial risk assessment. Uh, but an important part of this here and what initial risk assessment looks like is a spreadsheet with products listed on one side, uh, quantities you have licenses for, quantities you've deployed, but also an estimate financially of what that risk might be. But also it's a chance here to quickly identify some quick fixes there could be some very simple things that can be done, even at this moment in time, to reduce the problem. At Here's the end of this one. I yes. have a question for you. So on this, can an organization then <clears throat> uninstall or address things before the IBM audit team comes in and <clears throat> does their thing? Is there a way to proactively mitigate some of the potential issues? It's a good question. Um, and it's something we touch on in one of the later stages. At the initial risk assessment here, really what you're looking for are some very obvious fixes. And what I'm talking about here are, can be things as simple as servers that have been decommissioned but haven't been removed from the database. Um, it could be just poorly maintained uh, ILMT that just simply needs the reports cleaned up and repaired. It can be just simple... Um, things like error messages appearing in the dashboard that would create doubt that could be very, very quickly remediated. None of this is interfering with deployment at this point here, or, but, but it, some quick wins can be done here. Uh, a very simple example I've come across is a client where they hadn't bothered to exclude all of the, um, they, they were licensing all of the products as if they were production, yet they had many servers that were actually staging areas, DR, that simple correction alone dramatically reduced the compliance risks. So there's some quick fixes that can be done here. We will get back to that, uh, what I call remediation and strategy in the next uh, slide or two. So we've got the initial risk assessment. We've got a rough idea how bad things are. It's time to now have a chat with the auditor. And what we're talking about here really is the letter that you'll have received in from the auditor is generally fairly uh, broad. It will simply say, software license review for all products covered by um, IPLA or in your password advantage. But this can be negotiated. Um, first of all, you need to agree the NDA and um, that, that will take some negotiation. Why you need an NDA is that an audit is a special circumstance and any NDAs you have may not be strongly worded enough and will not protect the organization enough. So you need to make those more robust. And from a scope perspective, if the project, if you have a lot of products, particularly products that are not measured easily, uh, the auditor will actually be uh, quite open to negotiating. They will, have, of course, have to go back to IBM to verify this. But very often, they really just want to get a quick win. They want to get the project done as quickly as possible. And if you can propose suggested changes in scope, common ones, for example, might be you may exclude mainframe, you might exclude hardware or appliances. These are common requests and the auditor will very often um, accept them. You may decide that we focus on a different geographics. Let's just focus on Europe or on certain data centers, maybe your primary data centers and maybe not the third party ones. These are all things that are open to negotiation at the end of which then you will hopefully have agreed the uh, scope of this particular audit. Now this is all happening in parallel. Other things will be happening, which is the next phases. We will then at this point here, internally, we will do a license audit. And what I'm recommending very much here is you simulate the audit results before you hand them over to the auditor. This is collecting all of your entitlement, collecting all of your deployment, both for PVU and non-PVU products. Checking things like, have we got all the information? Have we got all the servers we might need? Have we got all of the entitlement we might need? And then update and prepare a license position. And this has the advantage really of First of all, giving you a sense of where the problems might be, but it also gives you a sense, you're now getting more and more closer and closer to how serious the financial situation might be. And you also get a chance to, again, identify some quick wins to maybe reduce or eliminate risks. 
So internal audit is again strongly advised that you get third party support here. Get a consulting company who's done this, who might even have ex auditors on their team to do this for you. But having this visibility before you hand it over is invaluable. Now, reduce and remediate. And Jeff, this gets back to your question here, which was, can we change things? The auditor will say no. Um, and that's where we will differ. Because in any production environment, there is constant change. There's servers being commissioned, decommissioned. There's information being moved around. There is um, a constant ebb and flow of information. Also, very often, there are compliance risks you know about that can be actually remediated and eliminated. Maybe mistakes were made that although the auditor might find them and correct them, they may not. And you want to present your cleanest, most correct license position possible. Simple things. It could be that you haven't, um, for example, uh, the DR licenses. They are free in the IBM world. Maybe you forgot to tick that off. Maybe there was past problems and errors in your ILMT that you now have discovered and you have tickets for. You want to prepare that information. There may be other simple strategies to reduce the compliance position because you cannot rely on the auditor to calculate the most optimal license position for you. They just have to do calculations and present the results. It is up to you to correct those numbers and to make sure that the calculations are correct. So that's very much what you need to be doing here. The remediation may also be, part of this too, can be preparing. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> sorry, is um, once you understand your problem, what caused it? Have you got some way of maybe explaining that problem? You can see that there's a shortfall, but it could be that, oh, that cluster was only recently upgraded. Maybe there's a particular uh, license interpretation that you were not clear on. Maybe there's a, a, a very good reason for why it was done and why you have a defense. Again, as part of the reduce and remediation, it may not, you, may not be that you change the reports or change the calculations. It might be that you're preparing your arguments for why an, a, a, the calculation is the way it is. It's also worth noting at this point here that you'll focus on the high value uh, problems. There may be 50 things wrong, but very often two or three of them are where the majority of your risk is and the ones for which you need to do the deep analysis and get to the bottom of what's causing it. And yeah, get that's where you focus the efforts and save the money. And on that note, Pierce, uh, you yes. mentioned something about optimal price, uh, optimal ELP and the way the auditor <laughs> would calculate it. I have never seen an auditor calculate it any other way than on behalf of the publisher. And so that is where the expertise from an external entity helps by making sure there's checks and balances on that calculation. That's just my experience. Oh, it's very, very true. And um, and I suppose you also got to keep in mind too that uh, like, a, like the doctors and the patients, auditors will differ. And one interpretation of the results can be interpreted very differently depending on the viewpoint. And within the organization, you may be able to explain what was actually meant by a certain license position. An auditor will take a very uh, black and white approach if the, the information, if the ILMT or if the snapshot report presents a piece of information, it will, they will evaluate it exactly as it is. But very often with a little bit of Q&A investigation, there might be a reason why. Or um, for example, the technical information might look like a production license tier three, but actually when you go and ask the administrators, they say, oh no, it's a tier one product and uh, it's non-production. The auditor does not have the opportunity to get that information unless you present it to them. So this is again, this preparation here, it helps you to fill out and provide the richest possible amount of information, accurate, um, on which to base the audit um, assessment later. So yeah, you need to help them to help you as well. Then we get to the good stuff, which is the external audit. Um, you'll have already established a project, um, and this is going to be a project you're going to be working with the with the auditor on. And they will have a plan. You will have a plan. I again always tell my clients, you're the one driving this, so you they you need to be courteous and polite, of course, but they'll have requests. You handle them on your schedule because it's ultimately your business being disrupted. You'll agree things like the entitlement position, 
and that might take several iterations. You'll agree on the deployment. And this may take many iterations because the first pass through, once you see the report, you might not agree with some of it. And with each pass through, it might take several before you reach a, uh, a consensus on what the actual deployment is. And then you get the auditor's report. And here's where things can also be interesting. This is not a fait complete in terms of you just take the report and there's no more about it. If you do not agree with it, you can again push back, you can uh, argue, and also you can actually insist that clarifications and notes are included in those reports before they're handed over to IBM. I would also say throughout this process here, you should allow no communication between the auditor and the, uh, in this case, IBM. Now that should be built into your NDA, but it should be emphasized continuously. There is no sharing of information um, throughout this process because very often at the beginning of, an ex of the external audit, the compliance com position can look very unpleasant. The numbers can be a huge gap, but with each pass through, with the more information you're providing and the more clarification you're providing, you can improve that number significantly. And you do not want an IBM account manager getting all excited about a huge payday at the beginning of a project when actually after a few passes through the process, that number dramatically reduces. So no sharing of the information with IBM. But there will come a point when you will have to and the auditor's report will be shared and then you enter into the commercial settlement. And this again is a negotiation. Um, it's where you negotiate and make, make, reach a final agreement on the audit findings. And this might seem strange, but the auditor will present one set of numbers, which you can continue to argue the case and can continue to say, actually, no, I do not agree with this. I highlighted my concerns during the, uh, the audit process, but you can argue and negotiate. And again, you will get concessions. The commercial settlement, which you should also be aware here, this is ultimately IBM wishing to do a deal. They are not concerned about compliance at this point. And it is not unusual, first of all, for a deal to be done at a significantly lower figure than the auditor's number. Also, you can buy a variety of different products that not, are not actually products that are out of commercial, uh, that are out of um, compliance with, the, with, the, with IBM. They ultimately wish to do a deal. And they will also, it might be an opportunity for you to include other things. You might decide, we're settling the audit here. Do you know what? Let's buy some other products. This is a commercial agreement here, and you can make many problems go away by just doing the right size deal. So continue, keep in mind, this is a commercial negotiation. It is no longer about compliance or IP. And then we reach a form of close. The last step here in the audit is, an audit, is a license audit close. And this is very much, uh, it does get neglected actually very often. When you've just done the deal, you just want to forget about the project and hopefully not to deal with that for another three years. But I do strongly advise that you record the lessons learned. Archive all your material and your evidence because it may be, a, it could be a very good starting point for your next audit because unfortunately mistakes repeat. Uh, you will want to make sure you get formal notice of closure from, from IBM. So the door is closed on those past compliance problems. Um, you want to go through the project yourself and actually ask yourself, how did this well? How do we react to this? Can we improve our, uh, our audit responses for future audits? And ultimately record and learn those lessons. So the audit close is again an important step. So hopefully what I've presented here to you is a useful framework. And as I said, many of these tasks we looked at here blow out into significant pieces of work, sometimes a day, sometimes many months. But the framework will give you an idea to check your through and ultimately uh, help you hopefully to get a better resolution in uh, your IBM license audits. So with that, um, Jeffrey, do you have any questions on behalf of our audience? I have one. And that is how, when you go through that settlement stage, how IBM or any other publisher sees it as a sales opportunity where you may see it as an opportunity to save money and just how that should be viewed by all parties. Because IBM does see that as a sales opportunity, I think. Oh, it's very much a sales opportunity. Uh, there's a reason why the compliance function reports into finance and not uh, uh, compliance within the IBM structure. 
Um, it's a sales opportunity, but it's also you very often the compliance gaps, they're legitimate. You've over deployed and you you just were poorly managing. But it's also a chance here for you to kind of open and I guess broaden the conversation and say, okay, we're short on licenses here, here, and here. How can we make this a win-win for all of us? How can we maybe, for example, decide, well, there was a new policy we were thinking about. Maybe we can look at that. Um, maybe we can cover off the licenses here and make this a better deal. Uh, it could also be very often there are different ways to close compliance gap. You can buy different products. You might have a shortfall in MQ, but it turns out if you buy some cloud pack, that has got built into it MQ entitlement. Or uh, similarly, there might be a product that you're sunsetting and you go, that compliance gap is historical or it was accidental. Can we cover that off? But actually, we will buy something else that um, that will make it better for everyone or the future we're moving towards. And again, IBM are practical here. Ultimately, they just want a big deal. And the, what makes up the inside of that deal is open to negotiations. Yes, and that's... That's a great way for us to end it. Pierce, I do thank you for sharing your expertise on IBM licensing, and uh, you are a wealth of information in this area. Thank you. I probably should have put my closing slide as well. So in case anyone needs to contact me, um, you'll probably find my face on LinkedIn, uh, info at licensehub.com uh, for any questions or queries. There's a phone number if you really want to WhatsApp me or uh, message me. And uh, this has been a pleasure, Jeffrey. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Pierce. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Pierce, for sharing your expertise with us. Now, a word from our sponsor, Service Management Leader. Service management is complex. Each organization will have its own unique complexities. Solving these complexities is hard, very hard, because these turbulent times have caused changing organizational priorities. The increased dependence on partners has only increased complexities. Every organization has a shortage of in-house expertise. The technologies, integrations, and reliance on data has increased the complexities exponentially. Now we are asked to incorporate emerging technologies into our already complex environment. Solving these complexities is the only way to deliver value in today's service management world. Fact. Most leaders are unhappy, very unhappy, with the value derived from their service management programs. Value is elusive, but it must come from getting the most out of your people, processes, and technology. And all three must work together. Every leader must ask themselves this one question. Are you getting enough value from your service management investments? IT service management solves business problems, not technical problems, as said frequently by our founder, Jeffrey Tiefertiller. To solve the complexities and deliver optimal value, we must focus on the business problems that need to be solved and align our activities accordingly. Jeffrey and service management leadership have solved this for many companies and organizations and can do so for you. They are experts in getting the most from service management investments. If you are not getting the desired value from your service management investment, contact Jeffrey Tiefertiller at Service Management Leadership today. Help is on the way.